Good evening and welcome from all of us at UMS. I'm Cayenne Harris, Vice President of Education and Community Engagement, and I'm delighted to begin this evening's digital event. Thanks to all of you for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. You're probably here because you recently viewed the UMS digital presentation, Paul Taylor, Celebrate the Dance Maker, which premiered on September 11th. If you haven't seen it yet, or you'd like to experience it once more, it will be available on the UMS website until midnight tonight. We have two illustrious guests for tonight's Q&A session. Michael Novak, Artistic Director of Paul Taylor Dance Company, and Dr. Angela Kane, who is on faculty at the University of Michigan, and has also served as a company historian for the Paul Taylor Dance Company since 2003. We're so thankful that they're here with us this evening. Over the next 40 minutes or so, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our guests and to hear their responses in this live streamed event. Please use the comment or chat function to share your questions. We'll be monitoring to ensure that our guests receive your questions and can respond. So without further ado, let's get started. I will kick us off with the first question. <laughs> And then I'll rejoin at the conclusion of this Q&A session. So Michael, what is the future of Paul Taylor Dance Company and Paul Taylor American Modern Dance? Thank you, Kyan, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, we're so excited to be with you um, and to uh, have this engaging experience. Um, the future is modern. Um, mm -hmm. And right now it's very virtual and very digital. <laughs> um, but we wanted to start off this this opportunity together to kind of um, talk about, you know, Paul's vision going forward. During our hour-long conversation, Angela and I talked about the 147 works and the range of Paul's legacy. And um, we didn't really talk about how visionary he was actually in terms of going forward. And it's important to know for, for everyone who's tuning in right now that on our 60th anniversary in 2014, Paul Taylor launched Paul Taylor American Modern Dance. And it was a curation model that modern dance really hadn't seen. And what Paul wanted, and this is after him studying, you know, what did George Balanchine do? What did Martha Graham do? What did Merce Cunningham do? Um, when a founder dies, what can we do to perpetuate the legacy going forward? And Paul's idea was to basically create a platform that was past, present, and future. And part of that was his 147 dances, um, which I have lovingly called the Taylor Collection, to kind of give them this stature and this place within the modern dance pantheon. But independent of that, he added two other facets. And one was to commission contemporary choreographers to come in for the first time in 60 years to make work on his company. Um, we have continued that model going forward. Um, Paul Taylor commissioned eight choreographers prior to his death. Um, I have commissioned three more plus one virtual work. Um, so new work is a new component to the repertory within the Paul Taylor canon. But then Paul Taylor loving modern dance and loving history, um, and it's a passion that actually Paul and I share, and Angela as well, um, it was about curating historical modern dance and kind of looking at the canon of modern dance outside of Taylor and the really important works um, and using our position as a modern dance institution to present companies or works on a platform um, that would let them be seen by audiences and students that might not get to actually see them. So it was this three-pronged approach that was meant to kind of blossom audiences' relationship to modern dance. And that's, in, a sh in like a nutshell, that's the future. Um, it's not just Taylor, it's new work, it's important work from the 19th and 20th centuries that I'm going back into archives and looking at. And it's bringing all these things together in a way that actually proves that modern dance is incredibly relevant. Um, it's not just this era in dance history that ended, it's actually a very engaging, important conversation going forward. And it gives fuel for the future, for future artists and students and dance makers. Um, so I'm synthesizing all of that 
right now, um, translating it virtually, you know, in this interim time. Um, but it kind of gives a testament to Paul Taylor's, um, and Angela, I'd love to like talk about this and get some questions and answers from people. Um, well, hopefully we'll be given the answers, but they might have answers too. Um, that Paul at the world and he, he, he was an observer and he took all these different influences to not just make his repertory, but to also give us this platform forward. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it was an ingenious model in many ways when you think about um, Martha Graham wanting her company to survive, but the, the huge legal issues around that, Merce Cunningham not wanting his company to survive beyond like a, a farewell tour. And, and then obviously balancing with that huge repertory, but within a company that's already a repertory company. And I think that's different because here was the Paul Taylor dance company six, over 60 years. And his most of his dancers, that's really all they had danced, you know? Um, or if they'd started out, you know, with a breadth of um, modern dance, even ballet training, something that Francie um, Huber said um, recently, you, you became a specialist. Um, yeah. in Paul's company. Yeah. Um, so here is this group of, you know, today's dancers who many of them joined the company straight out of college. Yeah. Um, so that's the repertory that they they have known um, to suddenly open it up, not just to commissions from, you know, these new cutting edge choreographers to actually get to experience those different physical, you know, embodied um, experiences, but also looking to the past. And I and I know once when I spoke to Paul um, in the very early days, so I didn't know him that well, he, he, he resented being compared to Martha Graham. I think most people, mm. they knew that he, that was the longest he'd danced with any of these sort of choreographers in the yeah. 50s. Um, and so what he tried to do is show the breadth and and he said to me at one point you know oh i actually i think back as far back to dennis sean that was you know yeah. one of his models and so you know so far just in the the last you know um five five years uh well only four years before paul passed you know you we've seen you the company's done Graham's Diversion of Angels. Mm -hmm. You've had the, um, a, a French company dancing Cunningham as part mm -hmm. of your New York seasons. Um, you've had Limo the Limon Company. Yeah, so you've ha and we've had Dances of Isadora by Sarah Mearns from New York City Valley. So, yep. the, so it's not just about a respect for that legacy and wanting to, to maintain that legacy. It is about what you said, giving contemporary audiences access to a lot of that earlier repertory and certainly for my you know for our students they don't get to see that much you know all in one like triple bill these days yeah. which is so it was a, it was an incredibly smart vision that he had um and the fact that now you know you're, you're already saying michael that you you're already thinking about three oh, more yeah. new works so yeah. which is great commissioned already commissioned yep no i'm probably i mean when i first was appointed by paul i I created a number of spreadsheets, <laughs> um, but one of the spreadsheets I started going through was like, okay, like like going into like the modern dance canon, like historically, I'm like, what are the works that um, I feel the Taylor dancers would do incredibly well um, and bring a new lens to the work. And at the same time, like, are there Taylor works that would help kind of package that his, that historical work in a way that makes it have a relevance. Right. Because um, yeah. it's really all about programming. Um, it's yeah. about like creating an evening of art for people and creating experiences. Um, so I tend to think of, um, I like food and I like, mm -hmm. you know, like I like a coarse, you know, yeah. like you have these, like your, yeah, your starter, your mousse bouche, you go to a yeah. salad and you go to your entree, you know, like you, like you work your way through. And I feel like an evening of dance is kind of like that. Yeah. Um, you want to bring an audience on this journey um, and to have the new voices and Taylor work and historical just opens your palate. Right. Um, right. And Paul was always very good at programming, even from the very early days, you know. Um, but I see there's a question coming in the chat, Michael, and this is one definitely for you. Um, so we've got 
do you want to we've got two at the moment we've got yeah. one about a, a dancer's typical day in PTDC and is there any difference between a daily a day rehearsing in the studio and a performance day I mean if, maybe you speak to that first and yeah um, so I'll do the uh, pre-COVID answer to the question. <laughs> um, so normally um, when I was a dancer in the company, um, my typical day was usually up around 6 or 7 a.m. Um, I liked to work out first thing in the morning um, early because the gym tended to be a little bit quiet. Um, I would do all my PT, um, physical therapy. I would work out. Um, have breakfast, we would have class at the Taylor School at 10 a.m. Class would be an hour and a half. Um, and then rehearsals would start at noon and rehearsals go from 12 to five. Um, and then usually, and this is a regular rehearsal day, and then at 5 p.m. usually um, there's a combination of like cool down that's happening, like where you're rolling out or you're doing your PT again. <laughs> um, or you're getting ready for the next day of choreography. Um, we have an extensive archive. Um, we have generations of footage. So um, a dance like Oriole, which you all saw, you know, we, we probably have, I mean, 10 to 15 videos of all these different generations doing it. So part of our work with our rehearsal directors um, is to look at these different versions and kind of like who did what, when, how. So there's a lot of research that actually goes into our rehearsal day. Um, and our repertory is huge. So normally we would have about 20 to 25 dances active. Um, right. So there's a lot of homework happening in terms of dancers learning off a video. Um, we have count sheets that go out and there's a lot of texting and calls. Um, but the idea is that when you come in at noon, and this was very true when Paul was there, and it's still true, that like noon is go. Noon is like, you need to know what you're doing, you need to know where you're going. Um, and we usually put a dance together per week, give or take. Performances, the whole like the whole timetable just kind of tilts, you know. So rather than me getting up at like six or seven a.m., it's like ten a.m. or so, ten a.m. or eleven a.m. Because um, then you like get up at ten, you do your gym, you do your PT class, tech rehearsal. You know, usually starts around two thirty or three. Mm -hmm. Our tech rehearsals in our company are full out. You run the show. There's no spacing. There's no like lighting checks. It's like the, you run the show yeah. and then you run the show for the <laughs> audience. Yeah. Um, so we do a full tech, full out. Um, we have a two hour window where usually people will like nap. They might eat, hair, makeup, you know. Um, then we have the performance. And then usually after that, everyone's adrenaline is high, <laughs> dinner. And then you're usually in bed by like midnight or one. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, it's, it's a day, it's a definite, it's a mm -hmm. definite day. So even though you might not only, you might only be dancing five to six hours, you're actually, right. the work that's happening outside of it is a lot. Right. And also on a, a an, in a New York rehearsal period, you know, there'll be one group of dancers in a smaller studio learning yeah. new roles from old repertory. And at the same time, you know, other dancers would be making a new work with Paul and you know so there's always a lot going on I think you know in, yeah. in, when you're back in New York you rarely you know you rarely get to rest we try to give we have a very like strict schedule in terms of what we're working on for that day in both studios but then there's also an element of flexibility when I was a dancer I was always trying to work a week ahead so if we were putting together a dance like Promethean Fire, not this week, but next week, I was trying to, I mean, it's like school, right? right? Like you're trying to get to the next chapter. Yeah. Um, you're being quizzed in the current chapter, but you're trying to read ahead. So I was always trying to like be a week ahead. Um, and we have extensive understudies too. So you're, the moment you get bored and you've learned all the roles that you're in, you may have 20 to 30 understudies because right. um, we all cover each other. Um, so you're, you're learning every year, you're learning about 30 to five to 40 roles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give or take, depending on the repertory in the year. Yeah, it's intense. So I can see two questions. One is, um, about what, what about Paul's choreography feels modern today? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a great question. Um, 
You know, the thing that when I think of modern dance and I think of where it came from in terms of its origins, um, it was it was an individual's form of rebellion. Um, it was a reaction to cultural systems, to aesthetic systems. Um, and it was an emotional one. And I, and I mean that in the sense that like, it was this liberation of the human body. It was the liberation away from the tutu and from the point shoes. And it was, it was rather than this like um, court, you know, state subsidized presentation of work, it was this individual carving their own path, finding their physicality within themselves and letting it out and not being confined by gender norms or movement norms. Um, and that spirit, I actually think, is still present. Um, and Paul definitely, the way he channeled movement into his body, um, the light and the dark, as we talked about, um, Paul was very funny. And he intentionally was funny to, be, to, to contrast those moments when he was dark. Right. He was always trying to um, rebel against himself in a weird way, like you could never place them in one category. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that rebellion is timeless because he was able to pick on these facets of humanity and the human condition that there is light and there is dark mm -hmm. and there is tragedy and there is comedy. Mm -hmm. And it, the way he navigated audiences through that is something that I think will continue forward. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And the, another question that I'll start maybe to try and answer, Michael, and then you come in um, about the reception at the, to Oriel and Scudorama when they were first new in the early 60s. And then why did Paul, um, you know, bring them back so many decades later? Um, so Oriel, I don't think ever left the repertory. It was so successful at its ADF premiere in 1962. Scudorama was around for a few years but then disappeared and I I think it's partly that in the late 60s a whole group of dancers you know moved on and new dancers mm. came in so it was a time of transition anyway but I remember when I first started doing um my research and I was looking at these snowy videos of Scudorama silent yeah. you know black and white video and I, I would say to Paul oh I'd love to see that what you know why why don't you bring it back Paul and he said he, well, he really wasn't interested for a period of time. He said, no, I've done I've done more uglier dances since then. And he would often make yeah. a reference to Last Look. Um, mm -hmm. And so when he brought that back, I, I went to St. Louis in 2008 because I felt I had to see it. Um, and one of the biggest shocks for me, and you know, I should have maybe known better, was I was so used to looking at black and white and I was so used to looking at you know, the video and black and white photographs. I hadn't, and there's this one section where the women, like they're called the, the secretaries, the, the women are typing, they're in black leotards with this great big white, it's almost like a, 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 cler a clerical collar, I saw mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, but what really struck me when I saw it live was the color. And, and it yeah. made those sections that were only black and white, like the three, you know, the women, um, just, you know, I, I was seeing it, A, for the first time, really, but in a, it made me think about the original work in a completely different way. Oh, you know, we say in the, the previous, you know, he wanted to make Scudorama as dark as Oriel was sunny. So I was I was only thinking dark, dark, dark. And it's it's how he it's plays. It's vibrant, yeah. It, how he plays with both things sometimes simultaneously. So I don't know if you, if you want to, you know, carry on with that question. Answer. Well, I think it's interesting and it actually speaks to one of the other questions that's come up about like the difference between being a dancer and an artistic director. And mm -hmm. I was always interested as a dancer, but like, Paul was always focused on the next thing. Um, he was always a year and a half ahead. Right. Right. And as a dancer, you're like, no, like we're like, this is what we're doing now. Like, like this is the work we're making now. And he was always obsessed with the next one, the next one, the next one. And I think these early works, you know, harken back to memories, you know, a place within his maturation as a choreographer where he was still finding himself. He was still, you know, he he had been dancing with Graham. He had been dancing with Merce, Balanchine. You see these influences. And I feel like in the early work, you see him wrestling with shedding um, 
these people who he, you know, right. kind of just right. absorbed their movement styles. So you see this like him finding himself. Right. And I think as he got older, he stepped into that. And I don't know if going back was something that really interested him. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for like a humor moment, like to like, oh, remember when I did that, you know, but like yeah. he was always, what's yeah. the next music? What's the next yeah. cast? Right. And as artistic director now, I get it because I'm, so right now I'm thinking of 22, 23. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, 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 I'm having to be two to three years ahead of where we are in this moment. Right. Um, obviously what's happening in the world right now has kind of shifted what 2021 was going to be, but I'm, I'm where Paul was. I'm way ahead. You know, I'm, there are dances that are in the repertory that I've already taken out and put back in at that point, you know? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I, I'm much more empathic to Paul's sense of like forward, forward, mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. you know, um, don't look behind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I love dance history, as you know. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm also like, but like what, what's in the past that we can like put in, in you know, mm -hmm. three or four years down the road that audiences might not be able to get now, but if I give them the right stepping stones as an audience, mm -hmm. that they'll get mm -hmm. there. Right. Right, yeah, and then another in the what how comparing um, the restaging of Paul's work versus the creative process, the process of creating <laughs> a new work. I mean, could you speak to that, Michael? So the big difference is dialogue. Okay. Um, I think the creative process with Paul was usually one of, um, at least in my time of learning how to read his mind, frankly. Um, and knowing, and Francine talked about this, you know, like like when when it's your place to step in, when it's your place to like, let him choreograph, don't, you know. And you have to build this relationship with him where he trusts you. Um, because making work, anything, creating anything from nothing is, can, can be tense, it can be difficult, you know, there can be friction. So you learn each other over time, mm -hmm. um, but it's cues from him. Right. right. When you reconstruct something, it's usually a lot of work that we're doing without him. We're doing it with right. Betty DeYoung, who's our rehearsal director. Um, she's been in the company since, or been with the company since 1962. She's yeah. an icon, a muse, a mentor um, to every generation. Um, we work with Betty. It's a lot of looking at videos, reading Paul's notes, getting stories, you know, and she kind of puts this whole thing together and it's much more of a um, shared experience. And then Paul comes in towards the end to get a sense of it. Right. Um, so the difference is Paul's there like day one moment, like zero colon zero zero, Paul's there with the reconstruction it may be two weeks or three weeks and it's like, don't come in the room. We're not, we're not there yet. We haven't found the physicality. We haven't found the gestures. Um, there's some timing issues or partnering that we want to get really flushed out so that it feels authentic to where we're going. And then he would come in and then he would, mm -hmm. he would drop his gems and pearls and show us how something should yeah. be done right. and then bring it to that next level. And could you just say something about how important the alumni network is when you're doing a restage? Because again, when Scudder Army yeah. came back, Dan Wagner was there, Liz Walton was there, you know, so many of the original cast flew to St. Louis and oh Sharon Kinney was also Sharon Kinney, there. Betty yeah. Betty Paul, yeah. Betty all, and and how the the gems that you get from individual dancers that from there's dance is an oral tradition. I mean it really is. And one of the things um, that I launched my first year was actually a um, oral history project. Um, I mean, partnered with Columbia University um, to start interviewing. We started interviewing alumni, not just on their stories in their personal life, but like their relationship to the Paul Taylor canon. Because I think, especially with Paul's work, it's very emotionally driven. Everything comes from a from a from a gestural place, and it's very easy to deviate and all of a sudden something can become um, just a copy mm -hmm. and there's no life in it. Yeah, yeah. And 
it's it's very it's 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 dangerous and it's something as director that I want to be very hyper aware of and what is lost when that happens. And I think the the key to that, to keeping that heart and that warmth are the stories of the alumni. Right. What Paul was like in the room, what inspired something, I was injured or I was in love that, you know, like <laughs> there's all these little things that are actually they're essential. Like it's not just steps and counts. It's it's much more than that. It is an emotional world and it takes a team of people, you know, to kind of pass that on. Uh -huh. So during this time, actually, we've been doing a lot of virtual work with our alumni network. Um, we've been doing coaching virtually um, where they've been able to come in on Zoom and they're working with dancers in the company on roles. And you're getting these stories and, um, our alumni is actually, we're actually able to be more engaged now than we really ever have before because we have the time. And now we have these amazing platforms that we didn't really know about or used as, as efficiently as we are now. Um, so they're, they're part of sustaining the legacy. Right. Um, I'm kind of, you know, steering the ship, but there's a lot of people with a lot of insights that I don't have. Mm -hmm. and channeling all those insights into the dancers, into the students is the only way I think we can go forward to keep the work feeling the way audiences know it can feel. Yeah. And so sort of related to that, somebody is asking if you can give any sort of um, like insights to what some of those works might be that you want to bring back from, you know, early repertory. Can you can you give anything away right now? I can now? give you anything away. Um, there's there's a work. Um, so we actually were going to launch um, in June. I had created what's called the Taylor Next series, and Taylor Next is the name of our young patrons group, which I helped co-found several years ago. And I was looking at historical modern dance, and we normally perform at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm which is a huge stage. <laughs> and a lot of these early historical works are intimate. They're small right. casts, they're made in small studios. And I was like, I'd love to have a platform that's smaller, that's more intimate, that would let these really shine. Um, so we were gonna perform at the Joyce, actually. We were gonna launch this series and some of the repertoire I was gonna bring back um, one is a duet from Seven New Dances, which Paul Taylor premiered in 1957 um, with costumes by Robert Rauschenberg. Um, and the music is Rain Sounds. And it's these two women Events. standing on stage. Um, and it's it's very simple gestures. It's about four and a half minutes. And it's kind of like the, the precursor to postmodernism. Right. Right. Um, and there's a fan blowing and you see their dresses billowing, but it's incredibly simple. Yeah. Um, so that was going to come back. Mm -hmm. Tracer and Fibers, two works from the early 1960s. Um, Tracer hasn't been seen in the main company in decades. Um, again, uh, it was his last collaboration with Robert Rauschenberg. Right. That was going to come back. Wow. Um, there's also a work called Images and Reflections, uh -huh. um, which is a very unusual, almost Cunningham-esque work where the music exists as its own thing, the dance exists as its own thing. And it reconstructing it has been interesting because not all the footage is there. So we're combining footage with Paul's notes because he took incredibly de detailed notes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was in the process of being put together. Um, I know I'm probably forgetting. Right, but that's um, a lot. And you will, when live performance happens, oh, again, yeah. you, we will get to see those. Yeah. yeah. yeah they're, very, they're a very different side of Paul yeah. that I think audiences don't normally see because they're so radical. Right. I mean, they're, they're right. very out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I, I think that's really important. And that was pre what was happening at Judson Church in the yeah. early 1960s, that he was he was a decade ahead. Yeah, right? he tried it and he was like, okay, yeah. I did it on the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. On to the next thing. And that's why he made Oriel in 1962, exactly. just months, the, the very point that Judson yeah. had their first performances. He looked at it and thought, 
that's not new. I've been doing it for, you know, so I'm going to do something totally different. I'm going to take hence, handle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which he thought would go down like a, you know, it wouldn't yeah. be the success it is. He thought that most of the moderns at ADF would be quite sort of antagonistic to like, you know, um, that baroque music. But um, so something else in the chat, which is very specific to Sacra. Well, yeah. in but also to other things like images, the other you know dance images um the the 2d movement um how how did he get that in the dancers yeah and the you know the profile and things so um in terms of the two-dimensional aspect um it, it actually appears in some of his work from the 1970s the sense of the freeze mm -hmm. and um this flatness mm -hmm. um and it's I think it becomes the most, the most hyper stylized within profiles and Sakura. Um, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's actually an incredibly challenging way to move. Um, and fortunately, because of the Taylor School, um, it, it you do that repertory a lot. And one of um, as a dancer in the company, there were two things that worked for me when we started doing profiles and Sakura. The first is I had taken classes at the school and done intensives, so I was very familiar with moving like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually also performed in um, Václav Majinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn when I was at Barnard College at, at Columbia. Um, and Najinsky right. arguably is probably one of the first choreographers to really flatten um, space and movement. Mm -hmm. So I had worked with Anne Hutchinson Glest and Claudia and Claudia Yeshki, you know, in that in that style, uh -huh. um, and found lightness and breath in it, and found a way to make it not feel static and held, which is a uh -huh. tendency because you're you're twisting yeah. so hard and you're trying to be specific. There's a way to like let it lengthen and be and and, and be expansive. Right. So my experience in Fawn translated um, to doing it in Sakura and profiles. Right. Um, but it's a lot of work and a lot of notes and a lot of rehearsal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think the other thing that he does with when he still then expects you to move really fluidly and really fast, <laughs> which is even, you know, which makes it even more difficult. Um, so I, I, there's something coming in from the chat about collaborators um, and uh, and the fact that you mentioned the collaboration with Alex Katz. I mean, do you want to speak? I mean, I think more recent Santo, La Costa and, and Jennifer Tipton have to be major players, but maybe something before we get to, to the late 80s with Santo. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. And we, we mentioned this in the, in the show was that like, you know, Paul was a visual artist. So I think he actually, he saw the stage in a very unique way in terms of the visual art aspect. Mm -hmm. So his collaborations early on with Robert Rauschenberg and with Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, um, right out of the gate, you know, they they were all in this tiny circle in New York City in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, and then going into Gene Moore and working with Gene Moore, who actually worked in window displays, and that's how Paul knew him, you know, and Gene Moore's eye for depth and perception and like fabric, you know, added another dimension, I think, to Paul. Um, and they collaborated for many pieces within the 1970s. Yeah. You know, his first collaboration with Katz was, I believe, Junction in 1959? Yeah. 61. 60, sorry. Real, real. Yeah. 61. Yeah. Um, so you have him also with Alex Katz. They're uncovering each other and they're developing yeah. in their own art. Alex Katz's use of color and bold print um, is still famous. Um, yes. He hasn't stopped yeah. at all. Alex Katz just keeps making yeah. beautiful art. Yeah. And they collaborated on over a dozen pieces. Yeah. Um, and, and then- we, loved, we talked about Alex, especially the work in the 70s, the dig diggity and then last look in the 80s. Yeah. He created obstacle courses Obstacles. for Paul. That was a challenge to, for Paul to, to create, you know, in a different way. Yeah. And, you know, even like a, there's a very famous Paul Taylor dance called Sunset. And oh, the idea okay. for Sunset, you know, is attributed to Alex. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
that yeah. he was in Spain, I believe, and saw men who were on leave, and he saw this woman in a white dress. And Alex oh. went back to Paul and was like, we should do something. And that yeah. started the path towards sunset. Yeah. Yeah. So this, what came first, the choreography or the visual artist or the collaboration? I mean, it's one big, it just depends. Um, and Jennifer Tipton's been with the company right. since the beginning. Yeah. Um, a, Titan in the lighting dance world. Um, well, not dance, I mean, just lighting Pro, world, yeah. like dance, opera, theater. <laughs> um, you know, she's she's created a new way of seeing the stage for audiences. And I think that also her growth influenced Paul and Santo Loquasto with his collaboration with Paul and Jennifer Tipton. I mean, it just, it matured and matured and matured. And, you know, you end with Promethean Fire as one example of, probably a dozen works where the the marriage of design and movement it's a it's just astounding but it shows paul's range and paul was not he wasn't only with one designer or one you know visual art he was hopping around and that's what made it so exciting when you look at the canon like you don't know what kind of paul taylor you're going to get because he was being inspired from so many different people what about, this is my question, it's not come in the chat, but I, yeah. I, I think it's very clear, the, the visual arts collaborations. What about Paul's collaborations with composers? Because I remember him saying to me once, he loves um, collaborating with dead composers. <laughs> because they don't they don't answer back, you know? Um, yeah. But he has done a few commissions and, you know, I, have you been involved in any of the most recent ones? Because I mean, they've been a bit volatile from what I can gather. Live, uh, recent, I can't think of any okay. new okay. compositions during my time in the company. Donald York um, was our music director, right. dear friend of Paul, um, and he composed a number of works um, yeah. Yeah. with Paul. Um, I do think Paul's relationship to Baroque composers specifically is fascinating. Um, there is this return throughout all 64 years, this return to Baroque um, and early classical music. And I think it. what's interesting is that even though the music comes from the same era, how Paul explores it is not consistent at all. Um, you can have a piece to Bach one, you know, in the 1960s, another piece to Bach in 2002. And the interpretation of Bach is completely different. What he's hearing is different. What he's exploiting from the music and the themes is different. So I feel like there was a structure and a um, Baroque music gave him this like solid platform and order that he could then rebel against and kind of do whatever he wanted and play with it, you know, play against it. Um, but arguably his his collaboration with Bach is considered to be, you know, um, one of the most famous. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so in the chat, Michael, what are your biggest challenges and biggest successes as you've taken on your position as artistic director of Paul Taylor Dance Company? My biggest challenge is time management. There is simply not enough of it. If any of you know how to find more of it, please let me know. Um, and I think um, the other challenge is interesting because as, as a dancer, um, your world is very structured. You know, like you have a performance, the curtain goes up, you do your job, the curtain goes down. Like there's a very, like the, the rehearsal day ends, you have your itinerary for tomorrow. Here's what you're doing. Here's the structure. And as I'm stepping into this leadership role, there's no curtain down at the end of the day. There's no definitive, you know, put the ghost light out on stage. You're done. Like you could work indefinitely. There's all, you're always behind. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just like, it's part of the job is like, you're always, trying to refine things and discover things and watch things and look at things and, you know, bring the ship going forward. Um, so it's, it's nonstop. Um, biggest successes is actually finding excitement in that. Um, 
and seeing audiences, um, as a side note, like seeing audiences respond to how things are curated. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I first got appointed um, was from a presenter. Um, and he said, don't watch the work, watch the audience watch the work. And they'll mm -hmm. tell you what's working. Right. And I thought that was really profound and it's something that I still do. And it's interesting to watch when audiences like unconsciously all sit up, you know, or sit back or start coughing, you know, like there's, th there's a group mind in the theater during an evening of theater and trying to assess, you know, was that a good journey? Was that a good meal that I took them on? You know, um, and did I give them everything or did I leave something out? Um, so the moments when audiences just like immediately stand to their feet, you know, to applaud, like, you know, you've like, okay, that uh -huh. the momentum of the night literally catapulted them up, <laughs> you know, to cheer. Um, so I'm always looking at that. And when that happens, it's incredibly gratifying. And it's gratifying for the artists too, you know, like, like that, they're, the audiences are with you. Yeah. So a question about how are the dancers doing currently during these times and what, you know, what, what are, if anything, are you working on? Yeah. Um, so what we did over the summer um, is we did a six week virtual program um, where we did teacher training for the Taylor School, um, where we actually created this, um, we started building a progression for dancers in the company to teach um, and to work with our alumni network. Because um, we have alumni who are in universities around the world, frankly, and they have, again, they have insights. And I was like, well, newer dancers coming in, like there's stories there, there's insights. How do you teach? What does the Taylor style mean to you? Is it a technique or a style? What are your views on it? And I'm really big on conversation as a way to educate artists it, it is it is it is obviously doing the work don't misunderstand me but i think doing the work with knowledge and insights only enriches the experience for the artist so doing this six week teacher training program getting artists you know to learn how to teach the style i think informs their own artistry so that was the first thing we did um, the second thing is we had private coaching um, and normally we're putting dances together fairly quickly. Um, so to have the time to take solos out of the repertory and to really invest emotionally in them and have dancers work with alumni, you know, at the beginning, middle and end, um, is a gift. Um, cause sometimes we don't have that time. Um, so that's the other thing. And on top of, we did a new virtual work by, cho by uh, choreographer Larry Kegwin, who was actually one of the first commissions um, that Paul Taylor made in 2015. Um, so Larry came back and made a virtual work called 22 Rooms. So we were doing that. Um, and we're, we're, we're figuring out what's next going into the fall. It's a lot of content and a lot of strategy where are people, where's New York City, you know, in terms of health and safety? Where are all the different areas within the U.S. that we might tour to? Where are they at with health? Um, what is the content that we can create to engage with audiences, to stay relevant? Um, so all of that is happening simultaneously. Right. And the, the Larry's work where you actually saw the dancers in their apartments That's, or on their yeah. balconies doing their own solos and how that was all then, you know, put together. It was, yeah, they were definitely keeping active. Um, yeah. So just following on from that, in terms of the dancers, you know, is, earlier you mentioned your physical therapy. Can you talk yeah. about the wear and tear of modern dance on the dancer's body and dancing with, dancing through injuries yeah. and pain? <laughs> um, so I have found that um, there, there are like, there, there can be common issues depending on the repertory. So you take a dance yeah. like Sacra, for example, um, there's incredibly difficult partnering and, and a lot of like just 
I mean, sure. frankly, like you're, you are dead pressing bodies over your head and you're twisted. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who might be in bodybuilding or weightlifting, like you rarely take a barbell over your head with a twist, you know, mm -hmm. and that creates a different torsion in the spine, you know, so men, shoulders usually, I have a lot of scapular issues. I have what's called scapular dyskinesis. Um, and it basically is when there's just a hypermobility in the shoulder that requires a lot of stabilization to be able to actually dead press and twist. So, um, but that's kind of exclusive to Sakura. So what can happen is that injuries or cross training becomes relative to the repertory of the year. So Sakura goes away. I may not do as much work on my shoulder, you know, um, but we did Martha Graham's the okay. version of Angels. And um, I had to do a lot of hamstring and glute work cross training because we tend to be a very quad dominant company in the sense that like it's, it's the big muscle groups to pull off what Taylor does. And to give you an example, like quad dominant hamstrings and glutes turn off. And so you have to really, so the, so the more quad dominant repertory, all of a sudden hamstrings and glutes become your cross training. Um, but the moment that piece goes away, hamstrings and glutes are fine. Um, so you learn over time what your body's like, how it responds to repertory. Um, also, if you're doing the same dance a lot, um, ankles and calves, because we do a lot of a lot of running, <laughs> um, we're known actually for beauty, beautiful running patterns. Um, and when choreographers come in, it's one of the most common things that they just want to see the Taylor dancers run because it's it's just a hallmark of the actual company. Um, but the more extreme you go with your banking as you're running, you know, you can have some tibia fibula like issues with your ankles so a lot of cross training with ankles if you're touring on a raked stage um mm -hmm. which often happens in europe and you're on a stage that's yeah. very slanted and you're trying to run in a circle if you've ever tried to run in a circle on like a grassy hill you'll notice the tendency to like fall as you're running down the hill and you try to go up the hill and it's it's much more difficult um but rake stages can also affect um ankles, joints, you know, so um, it's this constant ebb and flow and you learn, you learn how to take care of yourself. It's a lot of soft tissue rolling, a lot of um, massage after shows, a lot of ice baths. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that you start your day and you, you end your day. I mean, it's, it, that's what makes it an even longer day for dancers. It's the preparation and the, the you cool know, down. the winding down. Yeah. yeah. Especially as you get older. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I think we, there was one other in the chat about technology and where yeah. Taylor, you know, obviously we're we're dealing with technology right now, but how do you see that affecting the current times and maybe the future? I mean, I think I think what's happening right now is um, we have dancers are in a position right now because of devices, because of where we're at, that I actually think how dancers relate to their art form is going to shift to more of a um, directorial cinema, like the, the way Paul Taylor saw dances on stage as a visual artist, right? Okay, I think this generation of dancers as they're coming up and we're going through this, I think they're gonna start seeing dance through the lens of their devices. Mm -hmm. And I think what is gonna happen with dance films in the next couple of years, I think it's going to be fascinating because live theater and the stage has been taken away and it's created this conversation of, well, what can I make with technology? Um, not that choreographers like Morse Cunningham weren't experimenting with technology decades ago, but I think there's a generation of artists where technology and creation through it is going to be a really interesting branch as we go forward. Um, what's interesting to me in like the conversation about like modern dance and like what, like what, what makes Paul Taylor still modern and what makes modern like now, like, like why is it still relevant is because people are reacting to the times we're in now to create the stories and the content 
that get them through this time. You know, they're using their art form to, to get through what we're experiencing right now. And technology is that vehicle. Um, so I think you might see a lot more classes at universities being taught about dance and technology, about dance and film, about how to direct. Um, I think you might see a lot more collaborations between photographers and videographers and choreographers. I think it's gonna, I think, and that momentum was already there, I will say, I think like with like Instagram, um, the creation of digital content for TikTok, frankly, like it, it's, it's all was there, but I think you're gonna see this massive spike um, of the next generation of artists creating some incredible digital content. But also then maybe a real hunger for live performance again, you know. And that's what's going to be interesting is that where that intersection comes back when they go back into the stage. How does technology translate to what they're doing in the actual venue or audiences' experiences before or after? Right. Um, that's what I'm excited for. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, Ed, I don't. I think we. That's all of our questions. Um, and anything else you'd like to sort of? Okay, Anne's back. <laughs> Hello, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, what a wonderful conversation. It was great to be listening uh, behind the scenes. So thank you both so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, we're just about out of time. So uh, we had the perfect amount of questions. And um, Michael and Angela, before we conclude, do you have any final words you want to share? Anything that you haven't covered? Any, any words of advice or words of wisdom? I would just say, you know, to audiences out there, keep supporting the arts, um, whether it's music, opera, dance, theater, um, whatever your passion is, no amount is too small to your art form. Um, if you're a student who's listening, don't stop creating. Like just keep, keep digging deeper into who you are and your identity and expressing yourself and using technology, you know, but don't, don't let this stop you from growing. Use it as fuel to innovate. Um, that's my call to action for all of you. So. The arts will continue for sure. Oh, the arts will continue. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. arts will continue. Um, yeah. Thank you both so much for joining us this evening. It's been such a treat. Um, before we just wrap things up, uh, there are a couple of um, upcoming UMS digital events I wanted to mention quickly. Speaking of the arts continuing, Tomorrow evening, Tuesday, September 22nd, there's a virtual book launch for Everybody In, Nobody Out by former UMS President Ken Fisher. You can start watching live at 7 p.m. And next Tuesday, September 29th at 5.30 and Wednesday the 30th at noon, please join us for a two-part kickoff introduction to UMS's incredible lineup of digital residency artists. So once again, Thank you so much for, for everything you've shared tonight. Thank you both. And thanks to our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Um, uh, uh.